Welcome everyone to this next edition of our webinar series on optical coherence tomography. My name is Michael Leitner. I'm product and sales manager for OCT at 4Labs, and I will be the moderator for this live event today. During the first four editions of this webinar series on OCT, we already reviewed the basics of this optical imaging technology and took a closer look at some specific ways to assess sample information beyond what is available from standard intensity-based images. These and all other 4Labs webinars can be found on our website at www.4labs.com slash webinars or on the 4Labs YouTube channel. In this webinar today, we will have a closer look at the face information coded in spectral interferograms that we acquire in Fourier domain OCT. So when acquiring a series of spectra at one particular location, we can check if the phase for specific frequencies in the spectrum increases or decreases. So basically, if we have an upwards or downwards shift of the respective structures in the image. And today we will concentrate on the specific case of an oscillating phase, which points towards a vibration. Vibrometry, or in other words, the art of assessing and analyzing information on the amplitude and frequency of vibrations, is already a well-established technique in several academic or industrial application fields. And by pairing it with OCT, we can get vibrometry information also for subsurface structures and thereby clearly identify which structures within the sample are vibrating and that on the nanometer scale. Today, we will discuss one application of this fascinating approach in biomedicine. And it is an honor for me to introduce today's speakers, Professor Elizabeth Olsen and Dr. Elliot Strimbu, both from Columbia University in New York. Dr. Elizabeth Olsen received her BA and PhD in physics from Barnard College and the MIT. Her doctoral thesis was on electric sensing in weakly erected fish, and she transitioned to the auditory system as a postdoc at Boston University. Dr. Olsen is a professor in the departments of otolaryngology, had a neck surgery and biomedical engineering, and has directed the Fowler Memorial Lab at Columbia University since 2001. Dr. Elliot Strimbu received his PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, where he worked under Dolores Bozovich and used high-speed video microscopy to study mechanical responses of couple hair bundles from the frog saculus. Following grad school, he did a postdoc under Anders Friedberger at Linköping University in Sweden, where he used confocal microscopy and calcium imaging to study the workings of the guinea pig cochlea. Since 2016, Dr. Strimbo has worked at Columbia University under Elizabeth Olsen and is presently using OCT to investigate the effects of otoxic drugs on the active process in the mammalian ear. With that being said, I would like to hand over the stage to you, Elizabeth and Elliot. OK, <laughs> hello, everybody, and um, welcome to uh, our webinar that I'll be presenting with uh, with Elliot Strimbu. I'm um, we're really uh, excited to be here today, probably more excited than we should be, and. Um, I. Uh, just want to start out by acknowledging um, our collaborators, Christine Hendon, who's a professor at Columbia. She's really Columbia's uh, expert in OCT and got my lab uh, into it. And uh, Dr. Nathan Lynn was uh, the first grad student who worked with us on this project. And Brian Frost is, um, is another grad student who uh, you'll hear from a little bit at the very end. So this uh, webinar is on using phase sensitive spectral domain OCT for nanoscale vibrometry. And um, this, uh, just to give a little like preview of coming attractions for the this talk, the uh, this is a 
diagram by Heidi Nakajima of the ear. And um, if you take a cross section of the auditory part of the inner ear, which is the snail shaped part, you see something like like this with uh, the sensory tissue that coils around and around that uh, the snail like structure. And within the sensory tissue are the cells that respond to uh, sound. And as you can see, it, it's a multi layered structure and until a, the advent of OCT vibrometry for um, measurements of uh, vibration within the sensory tissue, we could really only measure from one surface at a time. So, um, and usually only one surface period. So we uh, are uh, very excited with the OCT for these vibration measurements, and they've uh, allowed us to uh, really make some uh, new, interesting and exciting discoveries. So. Um, an outline of the talk. First, I'm going to do a basic review of how spectral domain OCT imaging works, um, just as a sort of background for understanding how we can do uh, use vibrometry, use uh, OCT for making uh, motion measurements, which isn't its main um, job. And then uh, briefly discuss the hardware and software modifications for um, cochlear OCT vibrometry that we implemented. And then uh, Elliot's going to jump in during that, and he's going to uh, carry on with a sampling of some of the uh, the observations that have been made in the cochlea with OCT vibrometry. And finally, we're going to end with um, a video demonstration of a program for orienting between the optical coordinate system of the, the OCT and the anatomical coordinate system of the cochlea. And that's work by uh, Brian Frost. So first, uh, I'm going to start out with a brief review of not only OCT, but just really basic interferometry, which is um, sort of the, the bedrock that OCT sits on. So as probably many of you know, a basic Michelson type interferometer uses a laser with just a single wavelength. And um, I'll talk a lot about wave number. Wave number is equal to two pi over wavelength, and it's the more natural uh, thing to use when we're talking about OCT, but um, they're related in that simple way. And with uh, this kind of uh, simple interferometer with a single wavelength, we have two surfaces, one which would be like our reference, a fixed mirror and another movable mirror. Uh, the laser light is split between two beams and then recombined um, at a photo detector. And if you measure the power at that photo detector, the amount of power depends on the path length difference between those two beams. And this is just a, a demonstration. The red and the blue are the two beams, reference and uh, object beam. I've made them the same size. I've given them a, a size of one. Um, neither of those things are critical. But uh, in that case, you can see that as the path length difference, which is here, this delta changes, and then the gold is the, the sum of those two um, light beams, the power will go from, um, it, it varies as 2 plus 2 cosine k times delta, where delta is the path length difference. And so uh, you can get a situation where there's zero power, and you can get a situation where the power is, in this case, 4. Um, so this basic interferometer employs a pure single wavelength, so a single K value, and STOCT works by employing many K values. And in particular, the system we use is a Thorlabs Telesto 3, and in that case, the wavelength spans a range from um, around 1.18 to around 1.42 microns. So um, here's something that looks similar, but it's actually uh, different. I mean, if we just focus on one side in the beginning, the uh, here the path length uh, is fixed. So in the previous slide, the path length, I showed two different path lengths. And here, just again, focusing on one side, the path length you can see is fixed. And what's varying here is the uh, the wave number. And if you count the waves here, you can see there are more here than down here at the bottom. So it's changing a little bit. And um, but uh, the red and the blue are the same in each case. And here, as you uh, go and look at this array of photo detectors looking at different wave numbers, you can see some of those um, photo detectors for this particular K1, there's quite a lot of signal power, whereas for this K6, there's uh, these two um, wavelengths are nearly, waves are nearly out of phase, so the signal power is very small. 
here's a, I've taken the same Ks and just changed the delta. And here we get a different pattern on the photo detector array. So um, a Fourier, the, uh, the expression is the same as before, two plus two cosine K delta, because I've still kept them the same size and uh, amplitude one. But um, here, if, here the thing that's changing is K. And a Fourier transform over K will yield a peak at either delta one for this case or delta two at that case. So in, um, in OCT, that's how basically the way it works. Um, OCT uses a wide band light source and after interfering the two wide band beams, um, so after interfering the reference and the object beam, the light separated by wavelength um, with the spectrometer like a prism and it's sent to a, a linear array of photo detectors. And uh, our, the Thor lab system uses around 2000 photo detectors. And um, so this is, uh, you can think of this as the pattern for this delta, 280 microns, and then um, the K is varying through the range where the wavelength went from like around 1.2 to 1.4 um, microns. So um, here I've just zoomed in so you can see in the, the different asterisks, you can think of them as being different photo detectors. They're discrete photo detectors. And now if we take a, a 4A transform over K, we do end up with uh, a nice peak at 280 microns, or in this case, where we made the path length difference 1,000 microns, here it said 1,000 microns. If we um, zoom in on that peak, we can see it isn't exactly one, you know, a super sharp peak. And even in this idealized case, it's not super sharp because um, I haven't chosen the, um, the delta so that this would produce a, a sine wave that exactly fits on my array. If I did, then that would be just one sharp peak, but that would be a very artificial illustration. And uh, in OCT, in addition, our objects, which uh, are causing the reflection, are not going to be a mirror, and they're uh, they're going to be have some spread to them. And in addition, the OCT has its own um, non the um, optical section curve isn't infinitely sharp. So there are many different things that mean that our, uh, our peaks are not going to be absolutely sharp. Um, so these uh, patterns on the photo detector um, here correspond to a single reflecting surface, um, okay, with a path length difference, either 280 or 1000 microns. And um, so now we're going to look at what happens when we have a few reflecting surfaces the way, the way that we would have them in uh, in the cochlea if the light passes through the sensory tissue. And I um, should say here that another thing about the, the wavelengths is that they're infrared wavelengths, they can penetrate into tissue. So we would um, measure from a few surfaces with the same light beam that's penetrated in and, and reflected from several surfaces. So here's um, a pattern where we have three different surfaces. I put them at 280, 290, and 304 microns, which are like separations that are sort of like reasonable for the cochlea. And um, I've given them different amplitudes, which would depend on how reflective the different surfaces are. So you can see then you get this more interesting pattern on the photo detectors. Again, we can zoom in. And then if when we take the Fourier, um, do the Fourier transform of this pattern, we end up with uh, a whole little range of peaks and uh, we expect three peaks and we get three peaks. This one, the way the 304 microns fit, it's sort of right in between two, uh, two pixels in the uh, FFT. So we see a broader peak there. And um, so the pattern on the photo detectors maps via a Fourier transform. Uh, to locations of sur surfaces along the beam path. And this is the basic idea behind SDOCT imaging. So um, you get your photo detector pattern and then you do the Fourier transform and you get this so-called A scan um, for axial scan. And um, that's based on the magnitude of the, the Fourier transform of this uh, pattern on the photo detectors. As you know, when you uh, 
take a Fourier transform, you get a magnitude and a phase. So each of these points also has a phase associated with it, um, which is uh, is not used for the most standard OCT imaging. It's but it's there. You've you've done all this work and you've made all this analysis and you extracted the magnitude to get your A scan. But the phase is just sitting there waiting to see if it can be used for something, which is what we'll see it can be used for. So. Um, here, uh, if you're not, if you want them to get an actual image, what you do is you take an A scan and then you use the mirrors, in this case the mirrors within the Telesto, to sweep back and forth and you get a whole bunch of A scans and uh, they are put together into a, a B scan or brightness scan. And here you can see these different surfaces that we would be, um, that are producing a, a nice reflection in our A scan. So, um, and then put together, produce a pretty nice image of the sensory tissue. So, uh, how do we use this for vibrometry? Um, so, let's um, say that the surface corresponding to S1 is moving. So, instead of just being a uh, delta 1 naught, 280 microns, it's we're going to let it let it move. So it's has this little delta one as a function of time. So if you uh, thought about this surface here moving, um, the the distance between the different uh, pixels in the FFT is based on um, set by the wavelength of the light source and also importantly the bandwidth of the light source. The larger the bandwidth, the narrower this pixel spacing can be. Um, so when uh, and in in our case the pixel spacing is around three microns so if uh, if our thing moved by say nine microns this peak would actually hop from here to here to here it would move along um but if uh if it moves less than three microns then the peak isn't going to shift uh well the peak will shift a little bit but isn't going to shift to a new pixel and um the way that that will come out of the analysis will be um, in the phase of the FFT evaluated at this pixel. And um, so in the cochlea, the motions even uh, at very high sound pressure levels are less than one micron. And so we're analyzing these subpixel motions. So um, we can think about this uh, pattern um, and the only part that's changed is this uh, the first term because I'm not letting the other I'm not making the other surfaces move and this uh, sort of simulation illustration. So when we do what we do is we do the FFT over K. Well, first of all, we, we do a lot of A scans. We do uh, an A scan every 10 microseconds. So we uh, we get an image that we like. We get an A scan that looks good and then we uh, take data. So we take A scans every 10 microseconds while we're playing sound to the ear. And um, and then we do FFTs of every single one of those A scans and uh, we know by looking at the A scan where the where the peaks are, where the structures are. So then we'll look at the um, the phase at this pixel over time and if we can think about this term where we've let delta change as um, because it's subpixel as being um, this which which tells us which pixel it is plus the phase so when you take the FFT and you find the magnitude of this term then you also find the phase the phase is um, equal to k mid which is the the average sort of the average k so the the uh, middle wave num wavelength is 1.3 microns so the middle k is 2 pi over 1.3 microns is a number and so we will find the phase and the displacement that we're interested in is equal to that phase as a function of time divided by this k mid number so um to illustrate this I, I made a simulation in MATLAB, which uh, I'll show in a sec. But um, just to like prepare you for the, the little simulation, um, this is the total pattern. 
I made this delta T just be something very simple, something that's linearly increasing through one micron. Uh, that's sub three, it's sub uh, pixel motion, but a uh, pretty big motion um, in terms of the cochlea. And um, I performed the FFT, so I made it go through just 20 steps. So um, in our actual data set, we'd have uh, around, I don't know, up to a million steps, but I just made it go through 20 steps. And so at each single, each one of those, I do the FFT and then I look at the, uh, the phase of the FFT at this point, um, and then I'm gonna plot that up divided by K mid. And um, just uh, for completeness, completeness, I also look at the phase at these two points, which I, I didn't put in that they're moving. Um, so when I run the simulation, I think uh, I'm not gonna have the laser pointer because it'll be a MATLAB thing. So just you can, you'll be able to see the pattern change. And then if you also like look down here, this looks like there are many uh, curves on top of each other because it actually was all 20 that are, are already plotted here, but you'll see them uh, like move along. So let me, um, I'm gonna shop, stop sharing this and then I'm gonna share that MATLAB. Okay, so you can see it, the pattern changing. And now um, it'll plot up the, the analysis that FFT looking at the phase at that 280 micron initial peak point. You might see that the peak sort of shifted over, but in for practical reasons, when we do the experiment, we look at, you know, we define the peak in the beginning and we stick it to that pixel. So you can see we we uh, we get back what we what we expected to this uh, what we uh, would analyze as the motion of this peak here is uh, a linear motion through through one micron. So let me um, now I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. Let's just. Get my laser pointer back. <laughs> OK, so that's what we just saw. And then, like I said, I, I also looked at the uh, how the phase at these two points changed. And uh, ideally, those would be right at zero. They didn't they didn't change. And you can see what's reported as how those positions moved is is small. It's uh, whereas my my thing moved at like a micron. These things uh, move well at a mi up to a micron. These guys moved at a uh, 0.01 micron or less. This one's a uh, 0.004 microns or less. And the reason that those are detected as uh, sort of false motions is because of something called phase leakage, where um, you can see that this this point does. It's not super sharp like we talked about before. It's, and so these uh, these points get a little bit of the phase from that point, and uh, and you can see they also even change their size a little bit. So this is called a phase leakage. It's been reported, um, I think, for OCT. The first paper was by Ellerby, um, but we also wrote a long paper on it, Nathan Lynn and I, and. Um, it's actually similar to a problem that it exists in uh, LDV, laser Doppler velocimetry. So uh, it's not unique to OCT and it's uh, it hasn't really turned out to be a problem for our motion measurements, probably because everything is moving a little bit and those actual motions dominate. And um, but it's something to uh, to be aware of in case, uh, you know, it crops up unexpectedly. Um, so I'm uh, in a minute, Elliot's going to come over, but I'll just talk for a sec about the hardware modifications that we made in order to do these vibration measurements. Um, the, uh, the first thing was to, and this is work by Nathan Lynn, um, was to lock the clock of the uh, Telesto to Fortunately, it has a it, it can take an external trigger, so we locked that trigger to our uh, 
TDT, Tucker Davis Technologies, uh, digital to analog converting system. And uh, we do that partly with the software in the TDT and um, also in the software, sorry, in a hardware circuit that converts uh, the clock that we get out of the Tucker Davis system to something with the, the correct duty cycle for um, and timing for the for the Telesto. And um, so this is just the output of this little circuit and then it goes to this T which uh, then goes to both the Telesto uh, base and the Telesto computer. And another thing we did which uh, is uh, due to um, the uh, amazing machine shop person here at Columbia who uh, unfortunately recently retired, Gary Johnson, and he uh, he devised for us this uh, rotating stage, which has been uh, super helpful for our um, physiology measurements. So now I'm going to hand it over to to Elliot for a few minutes and he's going to talk about um, some of the software which he's done. Uh, the lion's share of the work on and also um, the uh, talk about some of the interesting physiological measurements just uh, from our lab and from from the other labs that are working on this. So take it away, Elliot. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so for sort of just imaging, taking like B scans or A scans or volume scans, uh, it's fine to control the Telesto that, that we have. Uh, with the software that just came with it. There's a very nice program from Thor Labs called Thor Image, um, and it's great for imaging, but for the vibrometry, we really need something more customizable. Uh, so we decided to control it with uh, some software that we've written in C++. It's all based on the Thor Lab software development kit that comes with the instrument. Um, it, it's sort of a command line program, so what you see at the bottom is just sort of the first menu that pops up when the, the program's run. It just asks the user, a number of questions like how long is the recording, what sort of recording we want to do, um, <clears throat> where do we want to point the scanners based on the, the video image, uh, etc. And the program just sort of um, initializes the OCT and, and uh, sets up the recording that we want to take. We always take sort of a structural B scan before and after each set of vibration recordings and then we compare these to make sure that the sample hasn't drifted over the several minutes that it takes to uh, to do the vibration measurements. And then uh, after it takes the sort of first B scan, the, the software that we wrote just um, initializes the OCT and waits for the trigger pulse from the DAC system uh, that Lisa talked about a moment ago. Now, there's a lot of post-processing involved in the OCT. Um, and some of the steps are also done in the C++ program. So there are some ancillary steps uh, dealing with like subtracting the background and doing a deconvolution. And then the uh, raw photo detector data are all measured using the measured in the wavelength domain and the wavelength to wave number conversion. And then the Fourier transform to get the A scan um, is all done in uh, C++. And then once we have sort of the, the raw data, the, the subsequent analysis scripts are all written in MATLAB uh, for our convenience. So um, just to briefly talk about vibrometry in the mammalian cochlea, um, this is a, a schematic cross section of the organ of Cordy, the, the hearing organ that passes through the middle region of the cochlea as we saw in some, uh, some slides ago. And the way the mammalian ear sort of works or the vertebrate ear works, when sound impinges on the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, that's transmitted to the three bones or ossicles in the middle ear, and that in turn induces a traveling pressure wave in the cochlea. And as the, the fluid in the cochlea is sort of pumped from one end to the other, um, that leads to sort of um, transverse um, or axial motion, um, and that in turn leads to some sort of shearing motion between the three structures or between some of the structures in the organ of Cordy. So the, the shearing motion sort of occurs between what's called the tectorial membrane and the reticular lamina, which is this, the laminar surface at the apical uh, side of the organ of Cordy. And this shearing motion 
uh, leads to deflection of the stereocilia or the hairs that protrude from the sensory hair cells. And it's actually the motion of these cilia um, that gates the mechanically gated ion channels that transmit the mechanical vibrations into electrical signals that are then sent to the nervous system. So the, the real transduction apparatus is sort of between the tectorial membrane and the reticular lamina. However, conventional cochlear vibrometry, uh, such as using you know, custom-built interferometers or a laser Doppler vibrometer or a velocimeter, have uh, historically measured uh, from the basal membrane. Now, I'll briefly talk about it in a moment. There are some measurements from the reticular lamina, but, but it's a little bit um, different. So um, we would really like to sort of understand what is the true mechanical input into the, the stereocilia bundles, and that's been very hard to measure historically. So um, what I have on this slide are some basilar membrane displacements that we measured, and these were taken with our OCT, but they look virtually identical to the basilar membrane vibrations that people have been measuring with laser Doppler vibrometers or interferometers for many decades now. And I'll just sort of walk you through this, this figure. So at the far left, these are the raw displacements of the basilar membrane at different sound pressure levels. So in this experiment, we went from 50 to 80 dB SPL or 0 0.006 pascals to 0.2 pascals. So we use the, the dB SPL scale, that's a logarithmic scale, whose zero is defined to be 20 micropascals, which is the approximate threshold of human hearing at about one kilohertz. So we have the different displacements at some point on the basilar membrane from 50 to 80 dB. The darker shades of blue indicate the higher sound pressure levels. And then in the middle panel, I've transformed this into the gain or the amplification. So what we do is take the raw displacement in nanometers and divide by the input pressure in pascals. And from this gain, we see that the responses of the basilar membrane are nonlinear near the best frequency, which in this case was around 26 kilohertz. So at around 26 kilohertz in this frequency band, the responses don't line up. But if we're well below the best frequency, the responses do line up. It's, it's linear in that region. And at the lower sound pressure levels, I'm sorry, at the lower frequencies, the lowest sound pressure level responses were, were mostly in the noise. So that's why we don't see the lightest blue at all here. Um, and then finally, I've showed the uh, phase as a function of frequency. And so this is just sort of the characteristic traveling wave, traveling wave delay that, that we measure. Now, what are the limits of this sort of conventional um, vibrometry? So why do we really need spectral domain phase microscopy and, and OCT? So as I briefly mentioned before, the traditional vibrometry techniques can only measure from one location, namely the first reflective surface in the light path. Now, this has typically been the basilar membrane at the base of the cochlea. That's sort of the high frequency location in the organ. And people do this by imaging through the round window membrane or through a small opening or fenestra in the bone. And as I mentioned, um, some measurements have been able, some groups have been able to measure from the apical surface of the organ of cordy near the reticular lamina. And these are usually done at the low frequency location of the cochlea close to its uh, apex. And this almost universally requires making an op opening in the audit capsule bone around the cochlea. So many of these measurements, but not all, uh, have historically required the use of artificial reflectors like glass beads or metal beads. And there's nothing wrong with using an artificial reflector, of course, but one has really no knowledge of how anything other than the reflector itself is moving. Uh, another problem with some of these conventional vibrometry techniques is that it's been difficult to combine with high resolution imaging, but you know, certainly not impossible. Some groups have done it. So, but uh, what many people do is just sort of aim the laser for the tissue and hope for the best. So there's always been some ambiguity about what location uh, people exactly have been measuring from. So uh, spectral domain phase microscopy and OCT can sort of address many of these um, uh, issues. So as Lisa talked about, we can simultaneously record from multiple locations along the optical axis. So that gives us simultaneous measurements of the basilar membrane and intraorgan of cordy vibrations. I'm not going to discuss it here in detail, but many groups are now imaging directly through the audit capsule bone. So 
Um, this is much less invasive, and if there is some loss of image quality and spatial resolution, but people are taking measurements from different uh, locations in the cochlea's um, uh, tonotopic axis uh, without opening the bone at all. Um, this can be combined with, you know, reasonably high resolution imaging at the same locations and the nearby times. So we'll, we'll see some of our own data in a few slides. So we have, uh, you know, reasonably precise measurements of the recording locations. Now, um, this is just some older data from Alfred Nuttall's group that was taken in Oregon, and they were sort of the first group to apply OCT to uh, cochlear vibrations. And what they're measuring here is the mechanical responses at the base of the guinea pig cochlea at around the 20 kilohertz location. And this was uh, taken some years ago with an older uh, OCT system. This wasn't a spectral domain system, it was time domain. But essentially they pointed the the diode at the sensory tissue and measured the motion of the basilar membrane here at the base of this um, B scan and from the reticular lamina at the top of the B scan. And what they found is that the reticular lamina moved quite a bit more than the basilar membrane. So here are the displacements from 20 to 90 dB SPL. And we see that the reticular lamina is moving a lot more at the lower sound pressure levels. At the highest level, their motion is pretty comparable. And um, the reticular lamina has sort of different tuning properties than the basilar membrane. So these were really some of the first OCT data that convinced people that the knowledge of the basilar membrane that people had been focused on for many decades can't be the whole story. And similar results to this have now been achieved by many groups, including our own. So here on this slide, I've shown some uh, vibration data that we've measured in the gerbil using our OCT. So I'll just walk everybody through this figure. So in panel A, we see a B scan that we took through the um, a B scan of the sensory tissue. So because we look through the round window membrane, the basilar membrane is the first surface that we see. So in all of the B scans that I'm going to show, the basilar membrane is up and the apical surface of the organ of cordy is sort of down. But here's the basilar membrane. This is sort of the outer hair cell region where we know the outer hair cells are based on the known anatomy and the distances. And so the tectorial membrane, which we don't see in all of our B scans or in most of them, it's probably somewhere around here. And the dashed line in the center of the B scan indicates where we took the vibration measurements. So in the next panel, this is the A scan, uh, sort of the average of the M scan that we measured. And in these, um, uh, with the Telesto, with the objective we have, the um, resolution is around, or not the resolution, I'm sorry, it's around 2.7 microns per pixel if you want to convert these raw pixel numbers to, to microns. But anyway, um, here I've plotted the basilar membrane uh, displacements as a function of frequency. This was at around the 25 or 26 kilohertz location in the gerbil. And then in the next panel in orange, I've plotted the outer hair cell region vibrations that we measured around 50 to 60 microns deeper. So we see immediately that the outer hair cell region is moving quite a bit more than the basilar membrane from the raw data. Um, and here in the next two panels, I've converted these to gains by dividing by the sound pressure level. And we also see uh, just as the displacement that the outer hair cell region has a higher gain and it has quite different tuning properties here in the low frequency region where the basilar membrane vibrations are sort of linear. They all overlap in this gain. In the outer hair cell region and in other regions, we see the responses are sort of nonlinear over a wide frequency band. So very different tuning in the outer hair cell region than we see at the BM. And then finally, I've plotted the phases of the two uh, structures. So they're, they're quite similar. Um, and they both show the sort of characteristic traveling wave delay. So we aren't just interested in two surfaces. We're interested in the vibrations across the organ of Cordy. And uh, how do we know, for example, that we're not just cherry picking the, the prettiest pixels or the best uh, structures? So th this figure may look a little busy, but I'll, I'll walk everyone through it. So here in panels A and B, we just see a B scan. This is from a different experiment from the previous slide. And then in panels C and D, we just have a zoom in of the B scan uh, with a schematic diagram of the organ of Cordy and a zoom in of the B scan. And what the traces below show are the basilar membrane and outer hair cell region gains that we measured from three pixels each from the basilar membrane region and the outer hair cell region. And we see that, you know, here in the BM, 
the, the brightest pixel or the brighter two pixels have a slightly better signal to noise ratio. So this sort of first pixel doesn't have quite the response at 40 dB or it's mostly in the noise. But aside from that, the responses for all of these three pixels or all of these three structures look very similar. And similarly, the displacements or the gains for these three pixels or these three structures in the outer hair cell region all look very similar and, and different from the VM responses. So it isn't a question of just uh, cherry picking the, the brightest pixels or the, the prettiest structures in the B scans. And, and finally, in the last row, these are the vibrations that were measured post-mortem a few minutes after the animal's death. And the BM vibrations look very similar to what people have been measuring post-mortem for many, many decades. The uh, amplitude sort of crashes and everything looks, looks linear. And something similar happens to the, the BM responses. Or, I'm sorry, the outer hair cell region responses. So th that's really all I want to talk about for the um, you know, uniaxial measurements that we've been taking. So lately we've gotten into sort of more complicated motion measurements. So just as the OCT can take a two-dimensional image or a B scan by taking a sequence of one-dimensional axial scans or A scans, we can sort of build up a two-dimensional map of the vibration patterns by taking a sequence of um, M scans with a known spacing. So how do we do this with the Telesto? So here at the far left on the top row, this is a, a micrograph of a, a cochlea with the basal membrane pointing up. Here's the outer hair cell region and the reticular lamina. And then in the next panel, we see a B scan from one of our own experiments. This is 150 microns wide. And what we do in these experiments is take a B scan and then we take a sequence of time locked uh, A scans or M scans with a known spacing, say 10 microns apart. So the three dashed lines and the three A scans in the next panel simply show the, the average A scans that we took in these 10 micron uh, intervals. Each of these A scans, of course, corresponds to a long M scan of 100,000 uh, points. And we perform the same vibration analysis on each of these um, individual M scans with a known spacing that we do for the uniaxial displacements. And that sort of gives us a sort of coarse two-dimensional map of the, the vibration. And then what we've done to sort of make this easier to understand is to use linear interpolation to give us a sort of two-dimensional map of the vibrations that has the same resolution as the original B scan. And then we find it helpful to compare this with the structural image that we took at the start of the measurement. So in the last panel, we see the sort of um, colored heat map of the vibrations. The color bar here at the lower right hand corner of the slide applies to all of the figures. So we see the, the vibration sort of overlaid on the structural image and we can really uh, align the, the vibration of each structure with the sort of known anatomy or the known anatomical feature. And then in the last panel, I've just, you know, we did this experiment over many frequencies and several amplitudes. And here we just see the, the displacements at three sound pressure levels, 60, 70, and 80 at three frequencies. So 27 kilohertz was the best frequency in this experiment. And we see that, you know, in all of the, the cases, the outer hair cell region sort of moves more than the other structures and its it, vibration um, amplitude increases with uh, the sound pressure level in a sort of nonlinear fashion. And so we've we've just become very interested in how the other structures are now uh, moving. So with that, I'm going to pass this back to Lisa, who's going to introduce the final uh, bit. So thank you. Moving along, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a new um, project that's uh, been going on in the lab by uh, Brian Frost, who's pictured here. Um, and Brian uh, is a electrical engineering, electrical engineering grad student working with uh, Christine Hendon and me. And he is, um, he recognized one of the uh, issues with OCT vibrometry is uh, that our, the uh, <clears throat> OCT optical axes sort of correspond with um, the anatomical axes, but uh, not not perfectly at all and um, 
in particular, like when we look at our B scan, it's it's easy to say, oh, that's like a, a cross section of the cochlea and and imagine that if we make measurements at these different locations, we're making measurements within one cross section. But in reality, we we because of the anatomical constraints, we in our lab, we look through the round window and try to aim the beam as, as apical as possible to get to regions of the cochlea that are um, healthier and more apt to give us nice responses. And because of that, we uh, it isn't really right to say that this B scan that looks pretty much like this really is that. And so um, Brian has uh, come up with a, a nice um, orienting GUI program that um, allows us to take uh, volume scans using the um, Thor Labs Telesto volume scan capabilities and then uh, using his own GUI developed um, and uh, analytical geometry program to um, to then better correlate the optical and the anatomical axes. So here's uh, his video. The cochlea is endowed with a coordinate system which varies with respect to Cartesian coordinates, as seen in panel B. The longitudinal direction is from base to apex, the radial direction is across the Bosler membrane from modiolus to outer wall, and the transverse direction is from the Bosler membrane into the organ of Corti. At every point, this system is different from the optical coordinates of the OCT system seen in panel A. This means that our vibration measurements in the optical Z direction contain components of multiple directions and anatomical coordinates, and that the locations of structures in anatomical space cannot be accurately gauged from a B scan. As such, we would like to know the relationship between optical and anatomical coordinates. While the anatomical coordinate system varies with space, it can be approximated as stationary local to a point of measurement by considering a planar approximation of the Bosler membrane as seen in panel C. We have written a program that allows us to make this planar approximation and explore an OCT volume scan in terms of both anatomical and optical coordinates. This is a volume scan from the gerbil base. In this XZ cross section, you could see the Bosler membrane and the outer hair cells, which are quite reflective. The Bosler membrane is relatively flat, and in our planar approximation, it will be a line in each B scan. If we move to different B scans, we could see that the Bosler membrane and the organ of Corti move up and down in the Z direction in different cross sections. This can be seen best in a YZ cross section. Uh, you can see this significant slope representing the longitudinal direction. So our z-axis, our measurement axis, has a significant longitudinal component. This is significant when we look at B scans because the Bosler membrane and the outer hair cells will lie in different longitudinal cross sections. Here specifically, the outer hair cells will lie far apical of the Bosler membrane. A plane is defined by any three non-collinear points. So performing our planar approximation of the Bosler membrane requires picking three points on the Bosler membrane. Here, I pick two points, one close to the modiolus and one uh, close to the outer wall along the Bosler membrane in this B scan. This defines the projection of the plane onto this B scan, which is a line segment. Having picked these points, I now have the line segment approximation. The program then asks if I'm okay with that. In this case, I am. Then I can pick the third point. That will be on the outer wall as well, and that will define the whole plane. The projection of that plane onto this B scan is a line. If I'm happy with that, I can press yes, and then the coordinate transformation matrix will be generated. With that, we can relate optical and anatomical coordinates and thereby explore the volume scan in both optical and anatomical coordinates. With this program, we move sliders to move around the volume scan in optical coordinates, not unlike the Thor image program. 
uh, but the anatomical coordinates uh, change in a way that's dependent on the change of basis matrix we generated through the planar approximation. So here we've uh, selected a point on the Bosler membrane in this first B scan, and we've set that as our reference zero in anatomical coordinates. We're interested in seeing in this same A scan where the reflective outer hair cells lie. As it turns out that although they're in the same A scan, they're in different longitudinal cross sections. In this case, the outer hair cells are 45 microns apical of the Bosler membrane in the same scan. To measure Bosler membrane in the same cross section as those outer hair cells, we have to move to a different optical location. With this program, we can find the A scan location necessary to measure outer hair cell and Bosler membrane in the same longitudinal cross section, that is at the same place in the cochlea's tonotopic map. Okay, so um, thanks, Brian, for uh, for the video. And um, now we've uh, we've come to the end of the talk, which um, is uh, terminating with this uh, the list of um, references that we. It's not at all complete, but just uh, some papers that that we thought were uh, were good to um, start with to learn more about this topic. And um, with that, I think. I uh, we're ready to go to the questions. Thank you very much, Elizabeth and Elliot, for these really interesting insights. And we already have several questions from the audience. And the first one comes from Dennis, who is asking, what is the difference between A and B scans? So an A scan is uh, a B scan is composed of A scans. So A scan stands for axial scan. And when you do um, a scan, it's not really a scan actually. When you just make a measurement with your beam going through, in our case, the sensory tissue, it uh, reflects back and um, nothing is scanning or moving, but because of the because of the fact that the light can penetrate into the tissue and, and reflect from several surfaces, you uh, you get a one dimensional um, like uh, profile from that. Then if you do want to do a B scan and get a real image, then you um, you do use the scanning mirrors in the in the uh, in our case in the telesto and you put together those uh, those A scans into a uh, a brightness scan. So what was like a line diagram in the A scan, you just convert those, uh, you know, the peaks into brightness and then um, put a bunch of them together to form the, the, the B scan, which stands for brightness scan. Thank you. Sunil from Boston asks why the phase leakage motion looks sinusoidal. Well, phase leakage is a very nonlinear uh, thing. If you uh, look in even um, for small motions because of the way because it comes into the way the phase behaves, it's um, it, it can behave in very uh, non intuitive ways. I mean, when we when you first sort of imagine it, you can think of it. You could think of it as um, OK, we have this peak that's moving in our left hand peak in that case was moving and um, it's sort of bleeding into the other peaks. So you might imagine some sort of a um, a weighted average, but and that uh, that would be intuitively pleasing. However, it just isn't the way it works. And um, so if you um, I mean, all I can really do because it's uh, there's no short answer to this is if you look at um, the paper by uh, Nathan Lin and and uh, Christine Hendon and me, or um, the earlier work by um, by Ellerby. But I mean, our paper is longer and has more examples pertaining to the cochlea. Then you can see all the sort of crazy stuff that can happen with phase leakage. But um, I think you really can see it clearly when you have this sort of an artificial system, when you have the real cochlea where the point right next to whatever point you're measuring at is also probably moving similarly 
you just wouldn't have uh, the leakage wouldn't be as as influential as it is when you look in these artificial systems. At least we haven't been uh, aware of it cropping up. So, um, but that's that's the answer. <laughs> Tim is asking, what is the fastest motion you can acquire? You can acquire, um, well, that's, I think the, um, the, that's set by a couple of different things, by the Telesto and by the TDT. And um, we are, our Tucker Davis system can actually measure down to five microsecond uh, sample, but um, the Telesto's minimum sample period is something like eight microseconds. So we ended up having to go to 10 microseconds. Um, so it really is set by the uh, the instruments, but um, I think what we are using is probably close to the current limit. Um, so 100 uh, kilohertz, so we can measure up to 50 kilohertz um, motions. The next question comes from Young. You mentioned that deconvolution is part of signal processing. Do you use blind deconvolution or do you measure a PSF and use Lucy Richardson, etc., for subsequent deconvolution? That's because we uh, we definitely don't do anything too advanced. We mainly use the um, the toolkit that comes with the Telesto, which is a little, uh, it's not exactly the most user friendly thing and Elliot could talk more about it, but just um, I can say a few things, which is that we, you you get the, the like the raw data from the photo detector um, linear array of photo detectors. And then there is um, analysis done because that's actually uh, linearly spaced in wavelength. So there needs to be a, uh, interpolation to turn that into K domain and then um, as opposed to Lambda domain and then of course the FFT that comes at the end and there's also um, windowing that's done and there is uh, also a correction for the fact that the uh, the light source even though it's a nice broadband light source it's not perfectly flat so there's some variation uh, in that that's just due to the light source. I mean, we'd like our whole pattern to be due to the inter interference pattern, but uh, the reality is there's a pattern there already. So you need to subtract that out. So there are many steps, but in terms of uh, deconvolution, if that's happening, it's happening in the Thor Labs um, software that we use. And um, I don't know, Elliot, do you want to say anything more about that? Uh, I mean, any of that would just be done at the initial step as it goes uh, from like the raw photo detector data to the ultimate uh, A scans or M scans that it's saving. So uh, I, I think it does a deconvolution when it sort of subtracts the noise and then divides by the smooth version of the, the background, not the noise, sorry, the, the background. Um, but I, I, I don't know or remember off the top of my head, I, I don't think it does anything especially fancy. Um, and, and again, uh, as you mentioned, that's just to go from the raw photo detector data to something uh, slightly more, more processed. Probably for more information on that, you could talk to the Thor Labs engineers. <laughs> okay, the next comment question comes from Pega. Nice results. What is the sensitivity? And could you give a number on sensitivity over recording rate? And how did you improve the SNR given the low reflectivity of tissue? Well, there are the sensitivity really depends on how reflective your particular spot is. And um, so that's um, so the way we try to improve it is by just, you know, first of all, getting a nice a scan that we say, okay, this looks this looks good. We have some nice peaks here. Let's take data here. <clears throat> the other um, things that we do are we uh, record for as long, like up to five or ten seconds sometimes. Which uh, and um, <clears throat> we also found that it was much better to 
as to do our frequency um, don't do frequency sweeps like we don't do one frequency at a time to get our um, frequency plots. We use um, this uh, Zvis signal that was um, sort of invented by Marcel van der Heiden and uh, Philip Joris, I think. And um, but it's anyway, it's a bunch of frequencies that come on at the same time. And that way you just you can take more data a lot faster. I mean, if you have 50 frequencies, you take it 50 times faster. And um, so those are the main the main things. I mean, it would be it would be nice to have a brighter light source, but uh, this is sort of as good as you can as we have right now. And um, but so yeah, those are the things. I don't know, Elliot. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I don't really have anything to add. I, I mean, it, it of course took a lot of uh, practice and things to just be able to find the structure and, and to identify it. So, so there is, you know, a, a lot of practice involved in getting the preparation to work and uh, finding the good reflective surfaces. Um, I, I think if you look at the one figure, uh, maybe they they can look at it later on the Thor Lab site. I mean, it shows the sort of noise floor in the the BM vibrations that we measured and and we can get a noise floor of you know 20 to 50 uh, picometers on on good experiments but there is some variation even across um, from one one cochlea to, to the other uh, so you know it is just a question of finding a, a good region with a good a, a scan and taking data through through that and um, you know of course playing with the the reference arm length and um, the 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 recording length, as you mentioned. The next question comes from Yong Horn from Rochester. You said you record B scans at the beginning and end of measurement sequence. Could you tell us how much is typical magnitude of the drift and could you discuss critical factors to reduce the drift? I'll leave that to Elliot. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, I think in a, in a good experiment, the drift would, you know, be a few microns, say over the 15 to 20 minutes that it takes to take a, a sequence of measurements. Um, it, it takes about uh, like 10 to 13 seconds for the instrument to do all of the processing for a one second recording. So in like the, the two dimensional experiments that, that I showed at the end, you know, we take like 13 to 15 slices and at three to four amplitudes. So it, it takes around 13 to 15 minutes to, to take all of those those measurements uh, so you know you could expect a lot of drift over that time and uh, fortunately in, in sort of the best experiments it's very small only a few microns to maybe 10 microns over over 15 to 20 minutes that might be a you know a, a typical number um, you, you know that's approaching the axial or I'm sorry the lateral resolution of the instrument itself so that that wouldn't be too too significant um, uh, of course, sometimes the, the drift can be much higher. Um, you know, it depends on, on what we're doing to the cochlea. Uh, in, in some recent experiments that I worked on, I was applying um, drugs across the round window membrane, and sometimes that, that led to like fluid accumulation in the round window space, probably due to the high osmolarity or maybe the sodium concentration. And uh, so we had to continuously wick the fluid out of the the round window so that that sort of lends the light because we image through the round window membrane and that, that sort of led to an apparent drift in the, the position of the sample and that that could actually be quite quite fast. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say in, in a good experiment of, you know, a few microns to 10 microns over like 20 minutes would be acceptable drift um, to sort of minimize it. Um, we just, uh, you know, you, you have to be a little bit careful, make sure everything's sort of bolted down. Um, we sort of in the experiment use a bit of dental cement to sort of firmly attach the the bulla when we uh you know open the the skin we sort of um you know cement the bulla to the goniometer that we use so that that sort of reduces some mechanical drift um uh, I, I mean it isn't so much a problem in gerbils but like in other uh, mammals like in guinea pigs the the middle ear muscles can actually contract and move everything um, so people have you know a section those or, or cut those in some experiments you could look at some of um, like like Fred Nuttall's papers where they've looked at um, 
you know, guinea pig vibrations with an OCT. Um, you know, the short answer is one just has to be quite, quite careful and, and use a lot of dental cement and make sure everything is uh, firm. And I, I mean, in spite of this, you know, sometimes we do lose, um, uh, you know, a, a recording because it simply drifted too much and one just has to discard that set and, and move on. But that's, you know, usually pretty few and far between. Um, so I, I don't know if that is a sufficient answer to your question or, or not. Um, you know, feel free to send me an email if you want to talk about it. I can show you some before and after B scans if, if you're interested. Um, yeah, that's, a, I don't know if that answered the question sufficiently or not. Bang asked, uh, do you think it is possible to do the measurement in vivo inside the cochlea with an endoscopic probe or something like that? What's the difficulties to achieve that? Well, we actually have done that. Um, Nathan Lin, uh, for his main thesis project, did make a probe. Um, so it's uh, not an endoscopic probe per se, it's just a single mode fiber with the lens at the end. I mean, I think of endoscope as being sort of a bundle of fibers, but in any case, it was a fiber optic probe. And that's, um, and I think other groups have done that as well. Um, so, and some of the probes, you know, rotate around, but that's, I don't think there's any particular barrier to doing that. It becomes a little, the um, the main sort of issue there is like, what are you going to do use for your reference beam? Either you use the um, the end of the fiber and then your object is like beyond the object beyond the fiber and your reference is just the fiber tip, which is uh, easier, but then you don't have any control over that really other than, um, you know, the initial uh, construction of the probe. The other way is to have a separate arm. Um, but you you give up all the nice uh, some some of the nice like functionality of the of the telesto system if you do that, but it, you can you can definitely that that's there's no real problem with uh, with doing that. It's um, you know it's a project. Thank you. Tim asks, how do you apply the vibration to the cochlea? We just apply it with uh, a sound. So we have a speaker tube that we uh, put in the ear canal and we calibrate that sound level with a microphone um, made by Gary Sokolich, a, a nice um, ultrasonic microphone, probe tube microphone. So um, it's, um, it's, you know, pretty much natural sound going directly into the ear canal. Okay, and the last question that we still can cover from Pega. You mentioned the pixel resolution is 2.75 microns. I assume it is due to the number of the pixels in the OCT signal. Would you gain more data if you improve this resolution, either using different spectrometers or zero padding the signal? Um, I mean, I think that's... Um, I... I don't know, to my mind, it's really determined by the bandwidth of the light source and uh, as well as the, the light source wavelength itself. Um, and so you um, putting more pixels in, like increasing the density, just gives you more depth, basically. Um, if you want to uh, increase the resolution, you need a, a wider bandwidth light source. And um, so we're all waiting for that. <laughs> and um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, maybe zero padding could give you something, but that seems like it would be pretty limited because it's a more fundamental issue. OK, thank you. So we are already well over time. Therefore, many thanks to everybody for attending our webinar today. If you have any ideas for OCT related topics that you would like to see discussed, please drop us a message at OCT at forlabs.com. The next general Forlabs webinar is scheduled for November 3rd and will be the second part of our series on how to use single mode fiber. The next OCT related webinar is scheduled for November 24th. When my dear colleagues Sebastian Schaefer and Steve Jäger will introduce us to the secrets of how to capture the perfect OCT image. I'm looking forward to seeing you again during our future events and wish you a nice day.